Hey, money makers, welcome back to another edition of Taking Stock Live. We're bringing you all the latest business news and telling you how it affects you and your money. In this case, economics news. What's going on with the country? The budget debates have begun. I want to remind you guys to drop a comment and let me know where you're joining us from, what part of the country or what part of the world. I'll shout you out when we start the show, when we start the discussion segment. Also remember to hit the like button, guys. Give us a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so just yet. Here's a look at what's coming up in tonight's show, followed by what's hot in business. And come on, let's get this money. The government plans to spend $1.3 trillion this financial year. We'll discuss some of the highlights from Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark's budget presentation with financial analyst Dennis Chung and public affairs analyst Kevin O'Brien Chang and the analysts weighing on the latest market developments. Scotia Group Jamaica declared an interim dividend of 40 cents to be paid on April 17. And it's earnings season. We'll take a look at the U.S. market's 2023 Q4 performance. But first, here's what's hot, brought to you by JMMB Group, your best interest at heart. Bitcoin hit a record high, soaring above 72,000 US dollars on Monday. The cryptocurrency traded as high as 72,700 in a surge that analysts say shows no signs of slowing down. Bitcoin prices are up 64% since the start of the year. The rally has been boosted by a flood of cash into the new spot Bitcoin exchange traded funds and hopes that the Federal Reserve will soon cut interest rates. Tech company Amber Group has partnered with the University University of Technology to help support startup businesses. The Amber Utech Launchpad program is set to support 100 startups. The program will provide the companies with mentorship from industry leaders, product development, and a strategic marketing positioning guidance. According to the company, this initiative is aimed at cultivating an ecosystem where ideas can mature into successful businesses and contribute to job creation. Distribution company A.S. Bryden and Sons is expanding to Barbados. The company has acquired a 55% controlling stake in Barbados retailer and distributor Stanfield Scott. Separate bought a controlling state in A.S. Bryden's in 2023. The transaction would allow A.S. Bryden to expand its premium beverage business outside of Trinidad for the first time. Stanfield Scott carries a wide range of products, including El Dorado and Plantation Rums, Twinnings Tears, and Endura Malt. CEO of A.S. Bryden, Richard Pandohi, said the move is a tactical one that will allow the company to double down on the premium alcoholic beverages market. Tesla's stock lost its spot among the top 10 biggest stocks in the S&P 500 last week. The S&P 500 is the index that tracks the stock performance of the 500 largest companies listed in the U.S. Tesla stock lost 11% during the week of March 4th to the 8th and is down almost 30% since the start of the year. This latest slide brought the company's overall market cap down to roughly 577 billion US dollars, landing it just outside the top 10. What's Hot was brought to you by JMMB Group, your best interest at heart. Butterfly in the sky. What? I can go twice as high. <laughs> So if this is you, download my free e-guide right now, Financial Terms Made Simple. It's a list of 40 commonly used financial terms broken down into simple language. Because don't you just hate when you look up a word and it gives you an even bigger word as a definition? So this is not that. I've made it as easy as possible so you can just whip it out and use it as a quick reference when you hear a term that you don't really understand. That way you don't miss investment opportunities because you were too embarrassed to ask ask what a bond is or what an IPO is. The link is in the description. Let's get this money.
Welcome back. Let me see who we have in the house. We've got Antoinette joining us all the way from the cold desert in Arizona. I kind of grudge you for the cold right now because why is it so hot already <clears throat> in Kingston and it's just early March? Like this is shaping up to be another record year in terms of the heat because this is this is not normal for so early in the year. It's extremely hot already. Oh, Dora, shout you out. Uh, Jermaine says it's Wednesday in China. We've got Dwight joining from Spanish Town. We've got Nano Sense greetings from far, far away. We've got JT in the Cayman Islands. We've got Reconstruction of Mindset in New York. We have Claudine saying, let's get this money. Dalton is in Grand Cayman. Richard just telling everybody, blessed evening, and a bunch of other people online. So good evening to you once again. Welcome back to our program. As you may know, Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark opened today's open Jamaica's 2024-2025 budget debate today this afternoon it wrapped up shortly after six and the government plans to spend 1.3 trillion Jamaican dollars this financial year so it's our biggest budget ever and joining me now to discuss some key highlights we have public affairs analyst Kevin O'Brien Chang and joining us shortly is going to be Dennis Chung, who is a financial analyst. But we start off with Kevin. Hi. Kevin, can you hear me? I don't know if Kevin is frozen. Is Kevin hearing me? Is everybody hearing me? Yeah, I'm hearing you. Hi, ah, how are you? Hi, go. Kalila. All right. I think there is a delay or maybe an internet connection. You look a bit clearer now, so... Yeah, let's, let's now. We're good now? Hmm? Are we good now? We now? Yeah. All right, good. So quite a few highlights. I know everybody always looks forward to the revenue measures at the end. And for the seventh consecutive year, we have no new taxes. But what really stood out for you, Kevin? The balance. Um, to me, sort of masterclass and balancing short term and long term. Um, political goodies and fiscal responsibility and the tax books and the people's lives. To me, the highlight wasn't so much a measure, but it's how he went through that threshold, tax threshold. At, at one point, you know, 2.25, it will cost this much, 2.5 cost this much, 3 million. It left me with a feeling that this man has gone through all the numbers carefully. My country is in good hands. I really don't have to worry about the financial part. He has it under control. And his mastery of the numbers let, left me thinking, it's hard to believe we've ever had a better finance minister. He just <laughs> gives me confidence that he is on top of the issues, has it under control. Uh, he's not going to do anything crazy, but he's still going to try and um, let people feel the, the, the benefits. So I, I, left, I listened and felt very reassured. I guess for you who approaches it from the social side and the political side, uh, you would look at it like that. For me as a journalist, I felt like he was taking me on a hill and gully ride before he got to what the actual announcement was. Uh, but yes, it was necessary for him to present the numbers. And I just want to play this clip. So Kristen, cue up the first clip for us on what that actual announcement was regarding the income tax threshold. We're not able to deliver the large increase in the threshold in one go for the reasons mentioned earlier. But, Madam Speaker, that doesn't mean that we can't do it little by little. Little by little. Like, little by little. Because they're expensive things. Right? And it's not little either. So, what do you say about that? Right? Step by step. What do you say about that? Right? Step by step. Step-by-step, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, in the context of everything else that we have announced, Madam Speaker, I'm announcing that effective April 2024, the income tax threshold on personal income tax will move from $1.5 million to $1.7 million, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this will cost approximately $9 billion. Right, so $9 billion is what it will cost. And 
man so but before we even get to the 9.6 billion nine, sorry the nine billion dollars and some people are already asking in the comments how are they gonna pay for it um i said we have is dennis on i said dennis is backstage i don't know if he's ready i'm 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 here but the 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 lighting not so good i'm in the car so i'll soon get to some good lighting all right i'll give you a little bit more time so like you were making the point kevin he did some math he gave us some numbers because this is one thing that people have been looking forward to ever since even 2016 and when they came into office they made that promise they delivered on that promise to raise the income tax threshold to 1.5 million dollars but they also said that they eventually want to basically abolish personal income tax. And so ever since then, we've been looking for signs and looking for signals and looking for them to do even more than what they did with the 1.5. And here we are today with 1.7. And what does this mean for you as a viewer, you as a Jamaican, you as a taxpayer in Jamaica? It means that it's more money for you in your pocket. The government is going to be taking less out of your income when you pay your taxes, your personal income tax. And that's the one that comes out before it even hits your bank account. That's the one that your employer takes out at source and gives to the tax office. You don't even get to sit up money. You are going to get more. I haven't had time to calculate the numbers and say exactly how much it is going to give back to you. But as you know, I will be working on that. So the next thing I think Kevin was also, you mentioned how he told us the various layers, the various levels that we have to get through. If it was raised to 2.1 billion, sorry, 2.1 million, it would have cost the country $26 billion. If it was raised to 2.5 million, it would have cost $34.6 billion. And if that threshold was raised to 3 million, which some people were calling for, it would have cost the country $45 billion. And so he gave us all the reasons why we couldn't do it. And then he made this announcement that is going to... But he also made the point, you know. Pensioners. percent of people are below the threshold already. So even that 1.5 is only affecting 30%. Exactly. Exactly. And then he made the point that this is going to also affect pensioners. And they put something special in place for the pensioners. So let's play that clip. five years of age receiving a pension from an approved statutory pension scheme or an approved superannuation scheme are entitled to a tax exemption of $80,000 restricted to the pension income only. If the pensioner is 55 years and over, the 80,000 tax exemption can also be applied to the other sources of income. This is known as the pension exemption. It is proposed that the annual pension exemption and the age relief exemption be both increased from $80,000 to $250,000. The pensioner aged 65 years and over will now enjoy a total income tax threshold of the one point, as of now, 1.5 million plus the 250,000 plus the 250,000 man speaker for a total income tax threshold of two million one hundred and seventy six dollars madam speaker and age 55 and over will be one million seven hundred and fifty thousand the estimated revenue loss associated with this increase in the pension exemption is one billion dollars madam speaker and the measures to take effect in the first quarter of fiscal year 24 25. so i think dennis is ready now dennis you're good now I, um the light is still not good but i can talk all right yeah we just have to work with it at this point what was the highlights of the budget presentation for you the highlight for me was the approach um, you know, I, you know about the the nugget and right, Dennis, this Dennis, sort of up. thing. You're breaking up badly, so you're gonna have to find a spot with. Yeah, you hear me now. Uh, try again. Let's see. 
no, breaking up too badly. You don't have to find a spot with better internet. But Dennis is agreeing with you, Kevin, the approach of how the budget was presented. So not just saying, we're giving you this, we're giving you that, but taking us through the journey of what of the considerations that the government has to make in order to arrive at their decisions. Yeah, well, you know, people forget the numbers, you know. But what you want from a finance minister, above all, is a sense of reassurance that, hey, he understands what he's doing. Um, but not everybody understands numbers. And we've had finance ministers who are pretty shaky on numbers. So you, can, as I said, you, you might forget the details, but the feeling of the reassurance, the confidence that, you know, Jamaica's on the right track in the right hands. I think that's what a lot of people take away from this. The, 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 con, the con feeling of confidence that he gives you that, you know, hey, the man just knows what he's doing. And there was a time, you know, Jamaica, you heard the budget, you're worried, are they getting this right? How about that? The taxes, all that, are, are we going, going down, the, you know, going down the toilet a couple of times, you heard budgets. Not anymore. Since, um, well, this administration, and especially since Mr. Clark, Dr. Clark came along, I personally don't worry. I listen to him. I mean, not to disagree with everything he's saying, but I do know he has gone through all the pros and the cons and that what he has put on the table is the best that he has come up with. And I don't think there's anyone, I've, any finance minister I've ever heard, who I know had the mastery of the numbers, went through the figures back and forth and come up with the best possible deal for Jamaica in the long run. That's how I see it. The, the other takeaway that came, the good, the goodest part was the um, tax credit, because while the the, th the threshold thing only applies to thirty percent of Jamaican, the tax credit everybody under three million, that's a huge chunk, um, a bigger chunk I think, and it's a little bit about getting twenty thousand dollars. It may not be much, but it's something. So we look at it, the government never done it for me yet. So I we're gonna have to explain for all taxpayers. This we don't have to explain how this tax credit works. We have the clip. Let's run the clip. And then Kevin, or if Dennis is ready at that time, we can explain how this tax credit is going to work. Under three, $3 million and under. The reverse tax credit, Madam Speaker, means that every registered taxpayer, Madam Speaker, who in the completed fiscal year did their part of contributing to society, whether through PAYE or being self-employed, Madam Speaker, and who earn under that threshold, Madam Speaker, this government, Madam Speaker, will provide for them a reverse tax credit, Madam Speaker, a tax credit, cash credit of $20,000. Madam Speaker, we have a total of 570,000 Jamaicans today who contribute to the Jamaican society through statutory deductions and some through personal income tax who will benefit from this measure. Madam Speaker, the cost of this program is $11.4 billion, and we consider this money very well spent. Reverse tax credits, Madam Speaker, are not new. They exist in other countries. It never existed before in Jamaica, but we are going to put it in place. Now, Madam Speaker, there's going to be an established system for the processing and payment of the reverse tax credit to be managed by the Tax Administration Jamaica. This will take some time to set up before it's ready. All right, I think Dennis is in better yeah. position now. All right, good. Yeah. So, Dennis, what is this reverse tax credit? What is he talking about? Basically, it was just a, a credit that's given back to persons who have been paying their tax. So, you know, um, it's somewhat like, you, you know, you pay, you pay money in and they're saying, OK, this is a tax credit that you'll get back. You know, um, you, know you pay $100 and you get $20 back. Um, so it's he really said, just a credit. He said cash credit so are, are we going to get cash money in our hands well well when you talk about cash nowadays you just talk about liquidity and not necessarily money in your hands 
Um, but, it, you know, it's, it's really maybe just a cash credit could be a credit against the income tax that you're paying. You know, so I think that's how it's going to work. That's, um, that's but, what I thought. That's what I assumed when he said tax credit, that is just yeah, basically yeah, deducted yeah. from your liability. Well, well, well I mean, as a, politician, when you, as, as a politician, when you say cash, it sounds better, eh? Uh huh. So, so yeah, maybe so that's why I use the term. Cash, when it's a cash credit, it sounds like you're gonna be getting some money in your hand. Yeah, yeah, but I, I think it's just a, a tax credit. Okay. Money you never had before. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Money yeah. Money you had last, that last month. It's it's money that you don't have to pay over, so technically right. it is money back to you, just that it's not right, right. in your hand. Right. All right, right. So, that affects so, all, everybody on the three million. Well, the threshold only affects thirty percent. This probably affects ninety percent of the taxpayers. Yeah, everybody, everybody gets a little little thing, and I guess it's to counter that them not doing nothing for me. Hey, with it, as long as you're paying taxes, of course, the ones who are outside the tax system, they don't benefit. How do you get any goodies to them? That's a good question. <laughs> So I have a few comments on it. Strong Link says the reverse tax credit is another twenty thousand for lower paid people. Three million is not that low. Uh, Yippee! Sorry, Yippee! Says a tax credit is a deductible against your income tax payable. So I say Angela yep. Brown. They, they cut to her. She didn't look very impressed with the twenty thousand. Uh, Who am I? Says income earned credit. Confusing. And then we have a few other people. Levar says I don't accept that explanation. What if you're not no longer working in the Jamaican system. However, you contributed for the physical years being mentioned. If you're not paying income tax now, then you can't get. You're not going to get it. Yeah, but if you're older yeah. and you're a pensioner, then you benefit in a different way from the pension, yeah. exemption, the increase in the pension exemption that he mentioned. Yeah, you'll you'll you'll, be, you'll benefit there. You'll benefit there. But but you know what? One of the things that we have to understand, you know, is that. You know where we're coming from. Um, you know where 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 we used to have taxes put on us every year. You know if you look at if you take a snapshot of the period he spoke about, nineteen eighty nine to twenty fifteen, and look at what has happened over the past six years. You know if you don't look at it, um, you know sort of gradually, but that period to this period is a significantly different time. You know. I know Kevin is old enough to remember when every year when the budget was being read, Money you used tax. to bite, you used to bite your fingernails and wonder what is coming next in terms it's of tax. Party tax. Yeah, yeah, you know. and, and 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 what it is is that you're moving from a situation where the economy was being inflated every year by inflation and taxes to one now where. When you can have a situation where taxes are being given back and there are no new taxes, it means that for the economy to grow, it is real production that is happening that's causing it. Mm -hmm. And that is the difference that we have to understand. You know, so when you look at this budget, the, 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 the philosophy around the budget is all about removing the impediments to productivity, right? People are not going to see the underground policies that they want coming out of this, because that's not what the finance minister's presentation is. It's going to be in the sectoral presentations. But this one is saying, hey, this is the balancing act that we can play. This is what we can afford to give back. This is the, this is the, these are the fiscal policies that we're going to put in place to remove those impediments and fund the things that are going to drive productivity. That's how we need to look at this budget that was presented. You know, it's so funny because I yeah, heard him in the earlier part of the presentation making some points, and I immediately thought of you, Dennis, because I know Dennis is always on the productivity, productivity, productivity yeah. point. Those changes to the procurement system that are going to make it easier to do business with the government, make it easier for you to get paid by the government. Tell us uh, some of the highlights there, Dennis. Oh, that, that one is significant. I mean, you know, I've been... Um, involved in the public sector for a while, and I can tell you, I mean, let, let's just look at the whole thing of garbage trucks. We know that we have a garbage problem, and if we don't get garbage trucks in the system, garbage will not be collected, and it will cause health, health problems and all of that. But guess what? The emergency procedure 
takes nine months to get them in, right? Hmm. And so therefore, when he speaks emergency, about raising, emergency, takes nine the, months. The, the emergency, the emergency that, <laughs> take nine months, right? So they when when he speaks about, <laughs> yeah, when he speaks about increasing the threshold, you're freeing up thousands of transactions that is going to drive productivity, right? Because it's going to drive business transactions. It's going to drive business to to um to, to all sorts of commercial enterprises. It's going to make the government a lot more efficient, right? It's it's going to remove the red tape. So that is how you increase productivity. There are some other things that we need to do. And he spoke about, you know, the funding of getting um, transportation system in place and all of that. We spend over $200 billion a year of productive time in traffic, right? So what his presentation has done is say, listen, I am going to clear the impediments where I can from a legislative point of view, but I'm going to put the funding where I think it will drive productivity. So that was a concept of this whole budget and, and why I like it. Because it, 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 it has a philosophy of it of removing the little things, the, the little things that are causing the stumbling block, removing them out of the way so that people can be more productive. And that is how we're going to really see sustainable growth in the country. Yeah, I thought that one was pretty significant as well. One of our viewers has this comment, who am I? says, importation of cheap, fresh vegetables, a sore eye on the budget presentation. Small farmers are crying now. I noticed the minister's body language while he was making that portion of the presentation. It seemed like it was something he didn't really want to do. We have the clip. Let's play. Jamaica is also obligated under the conditions of the obligated to the conditions set out by virtue of our membership in the WTO and based on the national treatment principle set out in the General Agreement of, on Trade and Tariff, GATT, Jamaica is categorically, and I say categorically, not permitted to implement policies or measures that are designed to protect domestic products. We, we have we have ASD, we can use those mechanisms, but using domestic taxation like GCT is not allowed. And Jamaica, my speaker, will be blacklisted if that duality remains. And so we have a choice. Either we do it on local or we take it off of foreign. Madam Speaker, in keeping with Jamaica's trade obligations, the GCT and all roots, raw foodstuffs Madam Speaker, imported, Madam Speaker, or domestic will be removed. This is a measure, Madam Speaker, that will be revenue negative and will result in foregoing $2.4 billion of revenue. Right. So no GCT on all raw food items. We're talking fruits, vegetables meat products as well. I expect that there's going to be quite some reaction to that tomorrow, Kevin. Well, that's the thing, but he said it was necessity. Either we're going to do it or get blacklisted. And this is going to require careful communication. And I'll say this about Nigel Clark. In my view, I would have never had a better finance minister who understood the numbers as well as him. But he's not the greatest communicator to the common man. And this one will have to be communicated very well by the JLP or they, they will take advantage of it. They have to be clear, we had no choice. And the repercussions, if we had done differently, it has to be communicated well. When they did the, the politician salary increases, Nigel was in charge of communicating that he did a terrible job in my view. So this one, the JLP better think through, how we're gonna communicate this so the PNP can't take political advantage of it. It's a necessity, but you gotta show the people why you had to do it in the language they can understand. Yeah. What do you make of that one, Dennis? Um, you know, I agree with Kevin. Um, this is one that, you know, um, can hurt. Um, but he said it's necessary. You know, I, I believe that um, from the WTO point of view. Um, of course, you know, I would love to see where we, we, we take measures 
to promote more local production. One of the things that I think we need to do, you know, um, is, is look at, for example, how can we align um, our local products more into places like the tourism sector, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there are ways that we can do it, um, you know, without violating the WTO um, by, by giving an impetus to local production. And I think that the biggest thing we can do is, is how can we get our local products into the tourism sector so we don't have to go through the, the bureaucracy of the export market or thing, you know, things like that, but help our farmers get in there. Right. right? And I think that's the way to deal with it. Right. And help our farmers become more competitive as well. That right. way, the difference on having GCT or not having GCT won't be that great. And we're going to opt for the local products anyway, because the price difference isn't that significant that we have to go for the imported product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. That, that's what we need to do. Strongly definitely. said, he implies that there are other measures that can be used to protect local farmers. So there's also that. <laughs> All right, uh, let's talk as well. So there was another announcement about the junior market, and this one has been up in, uh, up in the air for quite some time now, increasing the cap limit for the junior market of the stock exchange. 500 million, you can't exceed that. And now that is finally being increased to 750 million. Did he say April? Or did, I don't think he said when it becomes effective. Did he? I, I think he said April, yeah. I don't recall. How significant is that, Dennis? Oh, um, that, that one is good because what it does is it encourages people, more and more people to go on the stock exchange. Um, and what that does is that apart from giving the company the room to grow, it also expands the ownership base. So it's not just about giving the, the, the companies the opportunity and people the opportunity to, to grow, um, you know, with, with the benefits. But importantly for me is expanding share ownership. And I think that's critical because that's a way of getting the persons who, are, who don't have that amount of capital to get into the ownership of companies. And therefore, I think that one is, is, is very significant from that point of view. I agree 100%, Dennis. Because once upon a time, it said 21 families owned Jamaica, you know? And if you weren't one of them, you couldn't get a piece of the pie. Now anybody can buy shares and you have a piece of the pie. So it certainly breaks down that historical stratification that Jamaica has always had, where a certain bunch of people at the top, they, they had access to all the capital. Now you buy shares, you are a capital owner. So it's very critical. And until we get most Jamaicans having a piece of the pie, you know, you're not going to get the progress that we really want. So I fully agree, Dennis, there. It's critical to get more and more people getting um, owning stocks and having a piece of capital in Jamaica. Because that's what a stock is. I own a piece of the productivity of the country. Let's come to the question now of how do we afford to do all the things that Minister Clark mentioned? How do we afford to give back? I, I was tallying up some of the numbers, over $23 billion, including $9 billion from income tax. YPA says, how will they recoup this $9 billion from the income tax threshold? And I'll add by extension, over $20 billion from the other measures that they're giving back. How do they, where is this money coming from, Dennis? Well, he spoke about the securitization of debt which basically is just taking a bunch of debt, putting it together and selling it off. So he's going to raise $25 billion from that, and that will cover it. But, you know, more importantly for me is that what we are doing now in terms of giving back to people, and the, the minister did mention it, is as a result of the fact that we have reduced our debt to GDP. We have more fiscal space. You know, we have grown the economy for 10 consecutive quarters straight. We've reduced unemployment to 4.2%. That really is how we are able to afford it. It's not really just the securitization of the debt, right? Uh, but the fact of the matter is that we have done what we needed to do to lay the foundation to build a solid financial base, which is what people and businesses need to do right first and then 
when you have done all of that, you have the ability now to spend money in a discretionary way. And that is what we are doing now. And this is why we have to continue on the path we are on now because we cannot afford to go back to our 2013 or before that. We have to continue to ensure that we build our stocks more and more, not just give away money, right? And ensure that we can afford to, to spend the money on the things we want in the future. That's how it's, it's done. That's Explain and what you mean by securitization of the debt. Is that just a fancy way of saying we're still borrowing more money? No, what it means is that you, 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 um, people owe your money out there, right? And you put it together and you, you, you sell it and you, you get money for it. So, so you, you're selling your future receivables. Ah, uh, yes, I did hear, hear him mentioning that. So, receivables financing. Kevin, you wanted to add something there? Yeah, the, 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 one of the critical points of this budget, one of the impressive part, points of this budget to me was while we hear about the good is the tax threshold the pensioners, the infrastructure investment for new hospitals, well, Connell Regional and three other big ones, the roads. So while they're giving people something, yeah, we're doing something, you know, the, the, the investment in infrastructure will benefit Jamaicans in the long run. That's infrastructure is one of the most critical things for increasing productivity and make, make people better off in the long run. And, and that was one of the impressive things that you could see that balance, the, the thinking through of it, that yes, we're gonna give you something to make you happy short term, but for the, in the long term, every Jamaican's life is gonna get better with the hospitals and the roads and the, um, the infrastructure improvements. That, that was also critical. So then we would tend to think of the, the head, headline, the, you know, the tax threshold, but it is long-term things that will, in the long run, make us and our children and grandchildren better off. Speaking of us and our grandchildren being better off, I have a comment here from Instagram. It's this Janet. Janet said, boy, I'm a gone, yeah, man, because this is a rich people program. I want to hear how this budget will benefit the regular Jamaica that's selling at school gate and the handcart man. So what's in the budget? For yeah, better hospitals to go to, better roads to drive on. I mean, those are things everybody um, feels. Uh, yeah, well, well, you know, the truth is that, as I said, what, what the finance presentation does is set up the funding and the expenditure and clears the way um, in terms of some legislative hurdles that were causing issues. Um, in terms of what people want to hear, they're going to hear it in the sectoral presentation. And from the Prime, Minister, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister comes with those, present, with those uh, right. goodies, that, as we tend to call it. Yeah, that is where you're going to hear the things that are affecting people's lives daily, like transportation, like crime, you know, um, like those sorts of everyday issues, um, parochial roads, right? Those are the things that we're going to hear in the prime minister's presentation and the sectoral debate, which a lot of people don't listen to it. But that is where you find a lot of the gems in terms of understanding what is going to happen. For example, you know, we just had a local government election. What is the minister of local government going to say? How are we going to approach it differently, you know, so that we, we, we improve the lives of people? That is where you're going to see it, not, not in this presentation. Mm, so I see. Also significant was the the no more the, this university students don't need a guarantor yeah, anymore. Yeah, yeah. And that um, they're gonna get how much? Six hundred of them gonna get sixty thousand or something. Yeah. But again, uh, that that thing affects talk about talking about rich people. Well, that's how that's uh, the biggest way to move people from poor to not poor is education. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the number one way to get out of poverty for every poor people and um, access of for people to university, how can that not be a good thing? That's why I said the balance, people must look, and I'm knocking people, but you need to look not only at what I get in my hand now, what am I getting down the road? What are my children getting down the road? Think of those improvements and say, yeah, I can see, I can see where I'm going to be better off, or my children are better off. Well, we're definitely off to an interesting start. Any flaws that you can see, Dennis? Anything that you would criticize about the presentation? 
Yeah, well, what, 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 I like, what I want people to understand is that the presentation is, is trying to clear the way for productivity changes and give mm -hmm. back something. But as a country, we still have the fundamental issue of labor productivity. So I, I hear, for example, about the unemployment insurance coming. And that, for me, is a critical move because... It is the first step I've ever seen since 2013 when the IMF said it was necessary to labor market reform. But I haven't heard any further developments on that. So I expect that's going to come. For example, are we going to see less redundancy payments now? Right? What are we going to be talking about in terms of, you know, if someone is unemployed since they're going to get insurance now, how much is it going to be? And does that mean that we clear the air from the legislative things we normally see? with the IDT and that sort of thing, right? Um, so it, the, the flaw for me would be that we didn't get enough detail, but I don't expect that we're going to get it now. I think it's going to be fleshed out um, later. Um, so I didn't really have any great expectations for it, for that coming. Um, but, you know, we, we have to wait until we see what's coming out in the details to really make a judgment call on that. Kevin, for you. <laughs> Kevin frees up right when it's time to give yeah. the criticism. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could have been a little long, and some of the stuff he went into in detail, perhaps he could have not gone into so much detail. But for substance and thinking through and the approach, I really can't knock it. As I said, the amount of thinking that went into that thing for me to stand outside and knock it out, I would feel ashamed. Because clearly, the, and a lot of work went into that budget. When you hear the, the details and the analysis, I can't knock a man who worked so hard, clearly. All right. Thank you very much, Kevin O'Brien Chang, Dennis Chung. I appreciate you guys. I know, I know, Dennis, you just ran from one interview to come to this yeah, one. So yeah. I really appreciate that. All right. No problem. All right. All right, Kevin. Good. Thanks. Take care, guys. Yeah, and to our viewers, it's time for you to weigh in on tonight's poll question. You've been weighing in all evening already, but you can take this poll on Twitter or over on the community section of my YouTube channel. What were your top highlights from Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark's opening budget presentation? A, the income tax threshold increase from 1.5 mil to 1.7 million. B, the customs duty-free threshold increase. C, no SLB guarantor. D, unemployment insurance. E, other. What was your main highlight from the presentation? Let us know by taking that poll on Twitter or on the community tab of my YouTube channel. You can also leave your comments in the chat. There were so many things to choose from. The increase for pensioners. You had the, um, the removal of GCT on all imported and domestic fresh produce, fresh foods. Um, what was the other one? There are so many of them that we discussed already. Anyway, we got to move on with the program. Yesterday in the Money Mission community, we spoke, we spoke to Barrington McIntosh about drop shipping, which was something greatly requested from our community. Here's a clip of how that went. So whenever you see that you go on Amazon and you buy items, 53% of the items that are sold on Amazon are sold by third-party sellers like me and you because Amazon doesn't hold all of it. It's, it's not, not like all products that come from Amazon is sold by Amazon. They just fulfill most of it. So they don't sell everything. Amazon does not sell everything. They fulfill orders. They make sure that you get it. They make sure that you have a great customer experience. Now, why is that so important? Why is it so important to have that stability when you're dealing with customers? Now, look at the, the, the chart and look at the numbers. Amazon just keep growing 2019, 2020. They just keep going, going, going. And remember, this is in their prime users in 2020, 2019 to 2024. So users who are on prime, when they come to Amazon, like me and you, we don't really business with price most of the time. So yeah, we'll check, but we want the speed. We want it to ship fast. That's why we go to Amazon. So a lot of people buy the Prime membership because of that. They want the products to be shipped very quickly to them. And remember, I just mentioned a while ago, 
most of the items that are sold on Amazon is not sold by Amazon. They're sold by third-party sellers like me and probably soon you and everybody else come and buy, including us. Amazon has this ecosystem of trust. They're like, listen, when a customer comes to us and makes a purchase, if you don't like it, you can send it back. Nine, eight Amazon sales were $8 billion in prime sales, and that was last year. $8 billion in just prime sales alone. So you see that customers trust Amazon. They have a nice platform set up. So for me and you, when we're going to sell our products and have Amazon ship it to the customer for us, Amazon created the whole system called Fulfillment by Amazon. So there are two ways to fill it. You can fulfill by a merchant, which is me getting the sale, go and buy the product, go to the post office, send it to the customer, or you can pack up what you have, send it to Amazon, and they will fulfill the order for you. Yeah, interesting discussion we had with Barrington. You know, one of the things that stood out for me about that conversation was how he was explaining what were some of the top items selling out of Jamaica and how you should be thinking about becoming an exporter for your local company, your local business, for the Rasta man who met the slippers, for your auntie who is making her own pepper sauce. You can become exporters for them by using drop shipping method, using fulfillment by Amazon, and so on and so forth. So very interesting webinar last night. Check it out at moneymissionje.com. Remember, guys, to hit the like button. Up next, we've got your market recap, and the analysts are standing by. Hey, Moneymakers, join the KRM fam with our official merch. Get it now at KhalilaReynolds.com. Let's get this money. The JC Combine Index lost 4,000 points or 1% last week. 120 stocks traded across the main and junior markets for the week ending Friday, March 8, 2024. 43 made gains, 61 lost value, and 16 stayed the same. 742 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, valued at $1 billion. Wigden was last week's most traded stock. It took up 86% of market volume with 642 million shares trading. The stock lost 4 cents to open the new week at $1.07. cents. Trans Jamaican traded the second highest. The stock gained 32 cents to open Monday at $3.58. And Spurtree Spices rounded out last week's most traded with 18 million shares changing hands. The stock lost 13 cents to open Monday at $2.25. Now let's see who had the biggest gains for the week. Pulse Investments was the market's biggest gain up almost 23% last week. The stock opened Monday at $2.12. G West Corporation was the week's second biggest gain up 22%. And JPS 7% was up 17% to close the week at $49. On the losing side now, Sterling Investments was the week's biggest loser. The stock lost 23% open Monday at $0.02 cents US. The lab lost 21% opening the new week at $1.48. And T-Tech lost 17% to close the week at $2.07. Over on the Trinidad and Tobago Stock Exchange, the Composite Index was flat last week. JMMB was the most traded stock. The stock gained $0.07 cents to open Monday at $1.51 TT. Prestige Holdings was the biggest gain of the week. The stock was up 9% to start the week at $11.25 TT. And on the losing side, Trinidad Cement fell 7% to open Monday at $2.80 TT. Over in the US, the Dow Jones and the Nasdaq were down about 1% last week, while the S&P 500 was relatively flat. Over at the pumps, gas prices climbed $4.50, while the price of regular diesel fell $0.75, cents, and low sulfur diesel fell $1.20. In foreign exchange, it took an average $155.95 Jamaican to purchase one US dollar last Friday. That's 63 cents less than the week before. Meanwhile, it took an average $115.80 Jamaican to purchase one Canadian dollar. 
One British pound cost on average $198 Jamaican. And you could buy one euro for $171.50 Jamaican on average. Finally, on the crypto markets, Bitcoin set a new record on Monday up almost 10% to trade at $72,608 US on Monday. While Ethereum prices were up 5%, trading at $4,026 US on Monday. Disclaimer. This is not intended as financial advice. Please consult a licensed financial advisor before making investment decisions. Welcome back. And just before I introduce my analyst for tonight, let me take this comment from Instagram. Somebody, Javon Lev, wanted me to explain. He said, hey, Kalila, what does this statement mean for Jamaica? The government will increase the threshold for single source procurement from 1.5 million to 3 million. So just want to add, and I say a little note at the end saying, isn't it 1.7 million? So this is two completely different issues. So this is talking about single source procurement. This is different from the income tax threshold being raised. So procurement is how the government gets goods and services. When the government wants to do business with me or with you, they have to go through a procurement process. And many times that procurement process is a roundabout. You have to go here, there, and everywhere before you get approved. If I want to do business with the government, it has to go through this committee and then that committee, and then this other person have to approve that it comes back to the committee, then it goes back to the minister, then it comes back over here. And then nine months later, you're finally approved for the contract. And so what it's saying is that if it was $1.5 million or less, the government didn't have to go through that whole roundabout the Mulberry Bush procedure. They could just, it's a single source procurement process. They could just approve it. They're now moving that from a contract value of $1.5 million to $3 million. So it makes it easier for more people to do business with the government. That's all that means. All right, let's introduce our analyst for this evening. You know him very well. His name is David Rose. Hello, David. Evening, Kalila. This is just us again tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's been an, an eventful afternoon because I was in tune to YouTube. Somebody was complaining, by the way, that the clips were low. We got the clips from YouTube and the audio on YouTube was very very low for some reason we tried to boost it as much as possible but it was still low so just wanted to explain why it seemed that low uh, before we get into our topic for this evening now david one of the items coming out of the budget presentation that i want your reaction to specifically is that they're finally implementing the increase in the junior market cap so seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. what is this going 750 to be million i'm uh, sorry 750 million what will this mean for the market like how what are the next steps how are we going to see this play out what i'm waiting to hear or actually see is the actual amendment uh on paper and the reason being is that at, at the end of dr clark's presentation specifically to the junior market someone asked you know how would that be applied and dr clark said new listings so I'm waiting to see, you know, what is the final word on that? Because as it currently stands, for those who don't know, when a company wants to sit in the junior market, they have to list, you know, or seek to raise or the shareholders, either the shareholders are seeking to raise or a company is seeking to raise between 50 to $500 million in new shares being issued to the market in a sense, or right? shares being issued to the market. As a result of that $500 million cap that exists right now, an engineering market company that plans to list on the market effectively has a $2.5 billion cap set on its valuation, which, you know, results in some companies, you know, at the same time choosing to, you know, be a little more creative in how they list at the same time, you know, potentially not list as many shares as they want because of the constraint that comes from the cap. So with the increase to the seven hundred fifteen dollar mark, what that means is that the company, well, companies that plant this on the JSC, 
would effectively be able to list at a valuation of $3.75 billion versus you know, the $2.5 billion cap that exists right now. And what that means is that companies that plan to list they have an extra $250 million worth of room of additional equity that they can seek from the market, you know, and in turn, you know, use to grow the company even further. So I'm still waiting to actually hear, you know, what that final framework is going to look like because it affects only to new listings, that's different from it being applicable to the entire market. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm moving to see the actual document. A lot of people will be a lot of people will be disappointed if it's only for new listings, and I don't know that that's. Equitable. It's not a bad thing either. It's not a bad thing either, Kalila, because when you check it out right now, I I don't remember the specific number, but you know, a good number of companies have reached their ten-year mark. So we should remember that ten years ago, the last company to have listed in the junior market would have been Nostrad Express. Which would have been at the time when the junior market tax benefits, you know, were if in effect almost kaput. You know, so like 2014 to like 2015, 2016, there were literally no listings. I think Nostra is the only company to have so Nostra Express would have missed the December 31, 2013 deadline. Because back then what happened was if you didn't list within before the end of December 2013, you're only going to get the first five years of corporate income income tax benefit. You had companies like Derriman, CFF, MDS, who all sprinted to the end to list before the end of 2013. And they got the, the five year five year remission of 100%, other five years 50% remission. So, you know, a good chunk of companies have relatively aged off their benefits. And the remaining sit are either on 50% remission or are on the 100% remission right now. So in all honesty, it's going to be a bad thing if it's only a pass to new listings as well, because at the end of the day, it's going to encourage more companies to actually list on the junior market. And in on the, high, in the on the other hand, even if it's the case where a company has just kept it five hundred million mark, they can always you know, move to the main market once their tax break is actually no longer applicable. But why so, shouldn't it apply to? all companies on the junior market. Is that fair for some to be held to 500 while others get up to 750? So I have to remember there are two major benefits in the junior market. Well, one key benefit, which is that tax shield that you get to really thrive and expand. So someone can put it in a good, perfect sense. When you're you know, just a regular Jamaican company or any company, your aim is to limit how much taxes you pay to the taxman, which sometimes means that your company tries to not grow as fast or grow as big because you don't want to pay more taxes to the government. With that tax shield I get for the 10-year period, you effectively seek to grow as fast as you can to maximize that benefit and having to pay taxes at all. So once that 10-year tax emission window is over, there is no more specific benefit that applies in a sense. The only benefit that remains is of being on the junior market is really just the fact that you pay less than listing fees, you don't pay any fines, but otherwise, after that point, there's no more inherent additional benefits that come with being listed on that market. So even if it was a case whereby, as I say, it applied to all junior market companies and it created $750,000, but the company needs to raise another form of equity at a later date again, they are still need to move to the main market. So we should also remember that at the end of this month, we have Lasco distributors and Lasco manufacturing who will actually be graduating to the main market in short order at the end of this month. And you know, there are probably number three, sorry, number three, sorry, four, sorry, four five, or six, because the three Lasco at the same time. So that the original stuff companies at least on the junior market back then, and they're graduating. Well, David, I would think the benefit, the advantage would be that you would have lot more room you'd be able to raise more money while still maintaining the benefits the tax benefit of being on the junior stock market as still levar saying can we expect to see more apos which is what i would expect to see if, if indeed this applies to everybody now you have an opportunity to raise more money and still be on the junior market no no, no. so can you let some point in out remember that point just a while ago after the 10 years is up you don't have additional benefit anymore 
So, yeah, but there are lots of companies that are new on the Juno Stock Exchange as well. That no, 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 I agree. No, I agree. I agree there. So don't get me wrong. I'm just waiting to see how it is going to be applied because it could easily be retroactive up to, let's just say, 2014, you know, so that companies that would have just, you know, edged out or, you know, just had their remaining tax benef remission benefit, you know, expire benefit from additional space to raise equity. So, as I said, I need to see what the final paper does come out to be, because, as I mentioned here, we're going to raise the same 50, and then someone asks a question, and he gives a response. So, I went to see what the actual final tax amendment act is going to say before, you know, we fully debate on this a little further. But, as I pointed out, <clears throat> we, we, we have, it's been applicable to all companies we we'll definitely give them more space to raise more additional equity capital, you know, especially considering the high interest rate environment we're currently existing in, which would be a great life to some companies. But at the same time, it still means that, you know, more companies are going to see the marks as an attractive route and choose to actually list on the JSE as well. So apart from this listing companies benefiting from this, you know, increased uh, threshold in a sense, it's a great thing to see more different companies actually come public and for the ordinary Jamaican to get the benefit of owning an interest in growing Jamaican businesses. Because whereas in the USA you have a plethora of businesses that you can potentially choose to invest in, in Jamaica we're just still yet about 100 companies. And not all those companies are Jamaican either. You know, we'd have seen a couple of companies operating over the last decade or so, but still, it still stands the fact that we need more companies in the junior market or on the JC overall. And if it's the case that the junior market is that, you know, avenue for persons to come and list and then, you know, potentially go to the main market, so be it. End of the day, this is great, you know, for business overall, not specifically to the JC alone. We have a question, another question from IG. Once this is in effect, do you think it would lessen IPOs being oversubscribed or not to a large effect? It all comes down to the company as well, you know, because if the company makes sense and people really want and have the shares in, those, in that company, it's still going to have that all subscription because even when I think back to Dollar's IPO back in June, well, May slash June 2022, they were capped at the 500 million dollar mark, which was the amount that offer was capitalized at. And even if it was $750 dollars, Dollar still got over four billion dollars worth of, you know, applications that came in. So even if, you know, it's seven fifty or five hundred, if the company is very hot and people like it, they're still gonna apply, and the magnitude of the all subscription still comes down to the company's growth prospects and what they bring to the market, and you know that's really influenced as well by you know the overall macroeconomic environment, you know, whether rates are high or persons are seeking, you know, to really get higher returns. But at the end of the day, all options, you know, will be a common thing that will continue going forward, depending on, you know, what kind of company bring to the market and, you know, what do people actually see? Because I remember back in December 2017, Sinko was seeking $6 billion and they got $18 billion in a week. And that's, you know, when the market was still burgeoning and getting more and getting bigger, so end of the day, a larger dream cap, you know, will you know incentivize more listings. Your own subscription part will really come down to that company's value proposition to the market and potential investors. Mm. Tremaine says, wondering if I should take my company public. Lots of pros and cons. Shoot your shot, Tremaine. Give it a try. <laughs> Why not? At least, at the very least, look into it and see what it would take. For you to get that done we have another thing to look at this evening david it concerns kosher group jamaica they've declared an interim dividend payment to shareholders uh give us the update what's up with scotia <laughs> so last week thursday would have been scotia groups you know agm so for those who don't know every year a company you know will have an annual general meeting or a shareholder meeting where you know they actually Tell the shareholders is going on or what's the financial performance and in this case scotia's agm coincided with the release of their q1 financials so in the first quarter you know we saw an 11 percent growth in 
interest in net interest income, you know, up to eleven point one one billion dollars. You know, I think this is probably the third or fourth consecutive quarter where that figure has been above ten billion dollars, you know, per quarter. And net interest income is just the interest income they get off loans and securities, minus interest expense, so like deposits, for example. You know, the total, sorry, the net operating income was, you know, just 5% higher at $13.89 billion. But one of the consequences of Scotia growing so fast and growing bigger is the higher asset tax. So in the case of Scotia, the asset tax was up by probably about an extra $100 million when a year over year comparison. And on top of that, they would have had higher uh, staff costs and operating costs during the period, which, you know, would have <clears throat> slightly dragged down, you know, the bottom line. So what we end up seeing was about a 6% reduction in net profit from 3.37 billion to about $3.13 billion on a year over year comparison. So slight reduction, but in the context of Scotia State earning about $3 billion in a quarter, considering the asset tax as well being higher and everything else considered, is still a pretty good sign. The Quarterly dividend of 40 cents, $1.24 billion overall, you know, still a pretty strong and healthy payment. And for context, Scotia released their audited number, well, their, Scotia released their Q4 numbers back in December. So I got trading at about $33. It's trading at about $46.55 now as of today. It's up 21% just this year alone. <clears throat> so that's just to kind of show you that. The market was, you know, taking its time on its financial stocks, and we saw the market just piled directly heavily into Scotia with these continually improving results. At the time, Scotia trading below probably even nine times earnings, you know, price to earnings ratio. So that's to kind of show you that the financial stock and even other stock JC are trading at some significant discounted valuations. But at the same time, that's an opportunity for some persons to actually stock up and get you know, additional shares at what they consider cheaper prices based on their investment perspective. And you know, at the AGM, you know, Scotia would have discussed the four pillar strategy that is coming out of their parent company, the Bank of Nova Scotia, Canada, Bank of Nova Scotia in Canada, you know, which is focused on you know, their team, you know, on the customer. I'm going to write here. So it's on grand scale imperative businesses, Earn the primary client relationship, making it easy to do business with them, and winning as one team focused on the staff. So, you know, Scotia mentioned that you know, they're working on a pilot to allow uh, non customers, you know, to open or, you know, start the process of opening accounts online. They're looking to, you know, further integrate more of their subsidiaries and product offerings to their clients across the entire Scotia group. So, Scotia is you know, having a fun time and a great time in an environment where everybody else is somewhat struggling or contracting. Over $200 billion you know, worth of cash and cash equivalents and just strong capital adequacy across all business lines. So Scotia right now is just you know, enjoying a very great time and everybody is having a very rough time. Mm -hmm. oh, well, good for them and good for their shareholders as well. Thank you so much for that update, David. Appreciate it. Let's want to take a comment from the chat, Kalila, or? Do you see a specific one that you wanted to respond to? I saw someone ask about JPS's IPO. Oh, I haven't heard anything about that in ages. Have you? So just a little tidbit reminder. So at the JSC's Capital Markets and Regional Conference back in January, Dr. Clark mentioned that, you know, they were looking to create another vehicle as a means to, you know, give exposure to JPS in a sense. So, you know, we had been hearing about JPS shares being inside the market as a way for the government to divest its interest. But Dr. Clark mentioned creating a special purpose vehicle that would hold its interest in JPS shares, its TJ shares in the Trans Jamaican Highway. I think it was South Jamaica Power. So that was a vehicle that you know they he mentioned that they'd create it would own you know the 20% stake in TJH, the 90% stake in JPS, and the 
South Jamaica Power shares, and that vehicle will be on the JSC. That's a relatively easier way, potentially, <clears throat> to you know, get, create that exposure for the public, while allowing for the government to divest some of its interest to the public as well. Uh, but you know, you see, they want to list that vehicle. Uh, so I'm not sure we're going to like we're going to get in that direct exposure to own JPS shares because they're the other two largest shareholders, Mary Bainey and a Korean company. I don't know, I don't remember what you know their <clears throat> considerations are in this whole discussion, but that's potentially the reason why the finance minister mentioned this alternative route of an infrastructure special purpose vehicle that you know own these shares and the public would have interest in that vehicle. All right. All right. Thanks again, David. Appreciate it as usual. You're welcome, Kalila. We're going to take our final break and come back with your comments. I see you. Waiting for me? You're in my reach, but I have to have a little extra push to get close to you. Are you flirting with me? You want me to come get you, but you won't fall into my lap. You want me to show you that I want you. You want me to be responsible and proactive. Okay, you. I'm coming. All right, a lot of comments tonight. We had over 600 people joining us live, which is awesome. Love to see it. Daz says, LOL, 1.7, was hoping for three, but expected two at least, referring to the increase in the income tax threshold. Hey, I'll take it. It's better than nothing, right? Sean Brown said budget debate was a joke. So I'm seeing mixed reviews here about the budget debate. Nano Zen says, based on today's presentation, this is going to be a good year on the JSC. EPA says 30% increase in the overall budget this year over last year. How much of that increase is towards CapEx? Good question. I need to go take a look at the numbers, a deeper look, and prepare my own presentation for the bottom line. EPA again said this was not a poor people budget. Strong Link says excellent, responsible budget presentation. He was careful not to run with it. Who am I? Said speech didn't address growing Jamaica people equity. If it was to assure the nation, the notion of when I feel it, I think I understand what you were trying to say. Steve says, totally agree. Dr. Clark has his finger on the pulse. Yippee yay. Tax credit is a good introduction to the system, albeit 20000 a year is low. Strong link says we afford it by reducing the debt to GDP ratio. This is a good point. Every 1% reduction here frees up $10 billion dollars in fiscal space. That's why it's important. Christopher John says, most likely the PM is planning to announce a lot more goodies. I expect some announcements for NHT. They always leave that for the PM's presentation. Uh, Javon says, I agree, Minister Clark is perhaps the, finance, the finest finance minister we have seen in Jamaica to date. Just one issue I have with him so far, and that's putting forward a 200% increase for politicians. Not going to forget that one. Jackie says, boy, importation of vegetables, heart rending. I know the farmers are going to be on the air probably tomorrow complaining about that. But what can we do? Kuya says, no new taxes is a big deal for seven consecutive years. And I heard Dennis telling um, telling. Who's our other guest? Then it's Kevin telling Kevin that, you know, Kevin is old enough to remember when. I'm old enough to remember when. I haven't even been in this country that long. I've been here 15 years. I've been covering budget debate for about 12. And I remember when every year tax season come, uh, budget season come, and what we are expecting is an announcement in a, for an increase in taxes. What taxes is going to go up? How much is GCT going to go up by? How much is SCT going to go up by? And that was what we were anticipating with trepidation every budget season, every budget cycle. And now I you know, had a little discussion with my production team this afternoon 
and I'm telling them, okay, we have to wait on him to announce the revenue measures, more than likely he's going to say no new taxes and there probably are going to be a few tax rollbacks. I'm like, man, how far we have come. Tax rollbacks? Seven years ago, that was absolutely unheard of. EPA says disjointed presentation plus too long. He needed just one hour for that. I don't know about all, but it was pretty long. Like it was exhausting. Ryan says if we get a new hospital with improved services, then our health will improve significantly with improved roads and hospital, our self and love ones with getting better health treatment very fast. Nelly said or Neely says, so the regular Jamaicans are school gate sellers and hand cat man, kiss me teeth. <laughs> this must be a PNP commenting. Uh, sitting here watching says 48% of the tax revenue is the public sector wage bill, leaving only 52% for everything else. Listen, a few years ago, 48% was going to pay back debt, leaving 52% for everything else, including wages. So it's a vast improvement from where we were just a few years ago. Javon says, IPOs being proposed might be a good time for companies to come to the market as the market seems to be showing signs of a rebound, certainly with government policy. Uh, that might be just the incentive we need to spur some activity there again. Phil says, hopefully more renounceable rights issues and not APOs. That could be another option as well. <laughs> Lavar says, time for KRM Money Media to go IPO so I can buy up the additional 270 million shares. We're far from that, if ever, Lavar. And then Phil again, those two junior market rights issues that have been recently approved may become more interesting. That's MFS and Learn. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us yet another week. We appreciate it, especially since we had such robust communication, such robust conversation in the chat this week. Almost 700 people joining us live, which is might be a record. Actually, no, I think our record was when Andrew Holness was on with the number of live viewers, but this might be second. That's it for this week's show. Make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and share with a friend. Also subscribe to the newsletter at kalilareynolds.com slash newsletter. Newsletter, where I get this American accent from. What's coming up this week as well on Thursday, we have a brand new episode of The Property Source brought to you by Remax Elite. And we're gonna be talking about how to sell your property. What are the best, best practices? Well, uh, What's up with my tongue today? <laughs> uh, what are the best practices to sell your property? Coming up on the Property Source, it premieres on Thursday at 8 p.m. right here on my YouTube channel and on Facebook as well. Turn on the post notifications so you can be the first to see everything when it drops. We want to help people learn more about money so we can all get this money together. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Kalila Ray. And remember, those are my only accounts. I don't have any backup accounts. Please report scammers and impersonators whenever you see them. I do not do crypto trading on behalf of anybody. I don't have a Telegram group. I don't have any of that. If you want to connect with the analyst this week, check the description box below for their contact information. And also visit the website, kalilareynolds.com, for financial information you can use however you like it. Watch, listen, or read. Now tell a friend about taking stock because investing is the new sexy so let's make it cool to talk about money. I'm Kalila Reynolds. Thanks for watching. Let's get this money. <laughs>